Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to worship here at Austinville Christian Reformed Church on this uh, 11th day of October. Uh, a couple things are different this morning, which you will probably notice. Uh, we got rid of the tape, one, because it was getting yellow and really ugly. Uh, the other is, at this point, we're kind of used to where we can sit and feel comfortable sitting, so we're leaving that up to you. Uh, this is not an indication, of course, that, that we're all free and clear of viruses, especially going into cold and flu season. Uh, we're trading one for another, perhaps. But uh, just continue to do what you feel comfortable doing to keep yourself and others safe, but we're, uh, we're kind of glad to get rid of the tape because it was, it was kind of ugly. Uh, the other announcement you'll find in your bulletins, we're going to bring greeters back. Uh, that's a discretionary thing for you. If you feel comfortable shaking hands, there'll be plenty of hand sanitizer for in between and after and, and any other time you want to use hand sanitizer. If you want to just wave from a distance like we've been doing, that's fine too. But we want to have somebody at the door just to say, hi, welcome to worship. We're glad you're here this morning. Uh, come on in, all of the uh, above things that we want to say to one another on a Sunday morning. So we're going to be bringing some greeters back. Uh, I, I believe we'll be following the same schedule going through the alphabet. So if you are not comfortable greeting for whatever reason, just let us know and we can move on to the next letter of the alphabet. Um, or actually, there's plenty of A's, so I guess we just skip to the next <laughs> A. But uh, uh, we want to bring that back. Again, just to say welcome. Uh, as God welcomes us, welcome to his house, welcome to worship, you are welcome here in this place. And so we're slowly bringing elements back to feel a little more normal, and we're, we're happy to be able to do that. Uh, and also happy, of course, that you are here this morning with us. And as we continue our time, our call to worship comes from Psalm 80. You may also notice there are Bibles back in the pews. Uh, we didn't have time to get all the red books back, but we'll, we'll bring those back too. Psalm 80, beginning in verse number 7. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountainsides were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls? So that all who pass by pick its grapes. Boars from the forest ravage it, insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine. Let's join together in a moment of silent prayer as we ask God to continue watching over us. He greets us this morning with these words. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We'll continue our time of worship this morning with the singing of hymn number 570.
The reading is found on page 1798, since we get to use our pew Bible. Some of you have probably heard the phrase, a funny thing happened on the way to the office. Well, a strange thing happened to me as I was preparing the reading for today, as I was reading it for the first time. I got a phone call that a very dear friend had gone home to be with the Lord, just as I was reading this particular part. For we know that if the earth, earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. I like we must translation of that. For we know that at this poor tent, our earthly house is taken down. We have in heaven a building which God has provided, a house not built by human hands, but eternal. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given the Spirit as a deposit a down payment, a uh, earnest money, guaranteeing what is to come. Starting at verse 6, see if you can find three contrasts between the th now and the then. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since this is God's will for our lives, we ought to ask ourselves, what will Jesus say about us? Thank you, Dale. Good things to think about this morning. And I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, he has shed his earthly tent, but has gone home. So there is joy to be found in that. Uh, we'll gather together, uh, as we usually do at this time, the sharing of our uh, prayers. Uh, Jasmine, would you mind carrying the mic around? So if you have a prayer request, just raise your hand, uh, wave it frantically, however you wish to uh, get her attention. No tape, you can just walk right in. Uh, just prayers for my brother and his wife, uh, Karen, has been diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the blood plasma. And so they, she just started the first treatment this last week. But, uh, it is a very serious I think not curable, but uh, treatable. So let's be with them. Or they care. 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 I have a praise for Dale Jansen. He went up uh, Thursday to mail for a chat up in Arlene. According to him, the reports are good, but he has to lose a little weight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. <laughs> 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 
are we are incredibly grateful for a, a clean bill of health for you, Dale. Uh, we like having you around. for Mike and that he's bored. peacefully, that, that ears and hearts would be open, and that uh, those people who have, who have nefarious ends to those protests, that they would just stay away and stay home. Okay. Let us go to our God this morning in a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and the tape is gone. That which sought to divide us, which uh, compartmentalized us, a visible symbol of what the enemy would love to do. But the tape is gone. Just as any real power that Satan might have is also gone. Jesus, upon the cross, you broke his rule. The enemy has already lost. And there is nothing that can divide us. There is nothing that can keep us apart. The visible, physical tape is gone. The spiritual tape is gone as well. Remind us of all that keeps us one, of all that makes us a body, your body, your family, your people. For there is nothing that divides us from you and nothing that divides us from one another. Sitting here in your house, in this place, another physical reminder of our unity, of our community. May the sense of belonging and connectedness that is nurtured here in this place carry forward from these walls out into our everyday lives. Monday through Saturday, and not just on Sundays. For we are one through you. And as one voice, we lift up our prayers to you this morning. As one people, we come together to pray for one another, to pray for the various parts of our body, your body. This morning, we lift up Carolyn's brother and his wife, Karen, for the recent diagnosis of cancer. <coughs> for the treatments that will soon begin. That word, Lord, we hear all too often.
cancer. We lift her up to you during this time. The doctors, the nurses, all of those who will provide for her care. For her husband and for the family as they stand beside her. May your presence be all the more known during this time. May there be no doubt that you walk with her through this treatment. And Lord, we pray for a favorable outcome when all is done. For you, the great physician, are in control of it all. We give you praise for Dale's recent visit to the doctor, for a clean bill of health. We thank you that he's been able to do all that is necessary to keep himself healthy in between his checkups and that he would be able to do those things on a continual basis to maintain a level of health and wellness, that he would be a part of this body, a part of our community for many more years to come. We lift up might, and for whatever, whatever feelings of just being down, and not being able to leave the house as much, not being able to do the things that, that he used to enjoy. I think a lot of us are in those shoes right now. Lord, help might to find things to, to pick his spirits up, to be able to entertain himself and to, uh, to recognize your goodness, even though the things that he once enjoyed aren't, aren't as possible as they once were. We give you thanks as well for the healing that has gone on in Carol's body, for the healing from her surgery, for the doctors and for the nurses who were a part of this process with the hip and the recovery and everything that goes on. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your job well done. We thank you for good patience and, and, and compliance with post-surgical procedures, that she's done what is necessary as well to take care of herself and that she is, in her own words, ready to run. That you knit all of our bodies together. You created them to do all that they do. To maintain themselves, to repair themselves. These living tents we find ourselves in are a miracle. And for the gift of medicine, for the doctors, for the nurses, and for all of those who help keep us healthy, we give you thanks. We're thankful to be able to gather here in this place. <clears throat> We're happy to gather as your people to feel that calling to connect here in your house. For Selena and for Chick, familiar faces, but faces we haven't seen in a while. Thank you for bringing them here this morning. Thank you for the connectedness we have And Lord, for those who are gathering around this country, gathering around the world, speaking out for things that they believe in, there is, once again, Lord, nothing that divides us. No political affiliation, no national affiliation, no color or hue of our skin or hair. We are all one people, your people, your creation, bearers of your image. For the voices who speak out against the things that divide us, we give you thanks for their courage. But Lord, we also, we also condemn those voices who would try to steal the spotlight and turn it into something that it isn't. For those whose hearts are not where they belong, Lord, change them. May we be more unified, more drawn together. That those who would seek to do ill, show them the error of their ways. Help 
us all to love one another the way that you love us, to see one another the way you see us. One family, one body, your people, created in your image, called to your service. Once again, we give you thanks for this time this morning, the time to gather, to pray, to sing our songs, and to hear your word. Our prayer, as always, is to, to encounter you here, that your abiding presence would fill this room, fill our hearts, and fill our lives, that we would take you from this place out into the world that so desperately needs it. As we turn to a time of looking at your holy word, we ask that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds. Grow us, change us, mold us into the people you have created us to be. Through the power of your holy word and the power of your mighty name, all this we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you'd like to read along in your pew Bibles, can be found uh, John 15, starting in verse number 1, and that is on page 1,676. John chapter 15, verse number 1. That was a Romans 15 for some reason. Maybe that would have been a good one too. But this is the one I prepared for this morning. So John 15, verse number 1. And I probably my favorite passage in the whole of the Gospel of John. So, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, also, as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Last summer, I uh, engaged in a, a little bit of a building project out on the back patio there, and a few of you asked me, what are you building back there? And I was building a couple of little planter boxes with uh, kind of an arbor that goes up out of those and attaches, and, and hopefully would provide us some shade in the middle of the summer, uh, should what I planted in those boxes actually grow full enough to provide shade once they climb. Uh, it did not happen last summer. I didn't expect it to because of the plants were, were new. I was hoping for a little more shade this summer, but uh, as many can attest, this summer wasn't the greatest for growing anything. Um, I had a lot of tomatoes, and that was about the only thing that seemed to work. Uh, maybe next year. What I planted back there were hops. Humulus lupulus, the Latin name given to them. It is a, a nickname, uh, the dirt wolf, or the hop wolf. It's given that nickname because it can be fairly invasive, that once the, once the rhizome is in the ground, it will grow and grow in 
and spread and begin to choke out anything and everything that grows near it, which is why I built the planter boxes, because I figured uh, after we move on from this place, whenever that might be, they would probably appreciate not having hop vines everywhere in the backyard. But that little rhizome, if you're familiar with how those types of plants work, it's, it's a little healthy, hardy, kind of a root-based plant. And if you trim off about four inches or so, you can actually pull it from the ground, take it somewhere else, stick it back in the ground, and it will grow a whole new plant. So from one plant, you could possibly seed more and more and more over the years. But it has to be healthy. If the rhizome isn't strong enough to withstand being trimmed and pulled out of the ground and placed somewhere else, it's going to die. I bought four last year. Three of them went well. One of them did not take. So this year, I waited. I found the healthiest looking plant above ground anyway. Dug down a little bit, away from the base, trimmed off some, put that in the empty planter, crossed my fingers, prayed a whole lot, and waited. Two things could have gone wrong. One, the hop plant that I hoped to seed with a new rhizome might not have taken. The other is I might have taken too much from the other one and killed that one too. Fortunately enough, both survived and one actually thrived. I now have four hop plants growing in my backyard. I, of course, based my decision on which one to harvest a new chunk of rhizome from off of what I saw above the surface. I hoped that the leaves and the strength and the thickness and the vitality of the vine growing from the ground was a sign of what was underneath, of how well rooted it was, how healthy the base of the plant was. To me, it's a perfect metaphor for our lives of faith. That our strength, the strength of our connection, our rootedness in Jesus is shown by what's produced up above the ground. I think it's part of why I love this particular section of John 15 so much. I am the true vine, Jesus tells his disciples. It's not really a surprise that Jesus would use this analogy of the vine and the grapes and fruit bearing. It's a perfect analogy, really. Some people have uh, debated as to why he launched into this particular line of teaching at this particular point in the narrative, as they're off walking along. It's possible that they had passed the temple gates the golden vine that was depicted there above the entrance. Perhaps that sparked Jesus' imagination to say, ah, that vine there on the temple. It's a pretty vine, but it's not the one that matters. I'm the one that matters. That vine may look good, but I am the true vine. There's also numerous Old Testament references to Israel being a vine. What we began our order of worship with this morning, our call to worship from Psalm number 80, referring to the vine taken from Egypt. But Psalm 80 also tells us that vine is not healthy, that it would be cut down and burned. The prophet Jeremiah refers to the vine of Israel as being corrupt not producing fruit. Isaiah, the same imagery. Israel, a vine producing bad fruit. Why, you wonder? God's chosen people, why would they be bad? Why wouldn't they produce the types of fruits that they're supposed to produce? <clears throat> Jesus, the true vine. The only way to produce good fruit is to be connected to him, he tells us. What I find interesting about the way Jesus describes this relationship between the, between the vine and the branches is, well, it appears that the work of actually producing fruit has nothing to do with us. It's the work of the Father. It is the work of the Spirit. 
early in the season here living in Iowa, we know agriculturally that we trim back those dead branches on those things that we wish to produce year after year. We, we, we see with our eyes what's dead. We see with our eyes what needs to be trimmed away, and so it is trimmed. It's trimmed so that those branches that will not produce fruit can make room for the healthier ones that will. This past spring, I got to stand in, in Dale and Phyllis's front yard as he explained to me the process of trimming his apple trees. That the dead branches needed to be cut away so that those new, fresh, live branches could grow up in that space to be able to produce more apples. And immediately, this imagery popped into my head. But even the fruit-bearing branches, they need attention too. That after the buds are produced, after the fruit begins to form, you trim back even the fruit that isn't as good as it could be. So that the plant will feed the other, <clears throat> the other fruits that it is producing. You thin out a bunch of apples so that the, the one or two apples within that bunch will become bigger and better. That all of the nutrients the tree is pulling in make those apples bigger. It's the same thing with hops. Fifteen to twenty vines may pop out of the ground. You pick the five healthiest and strongest and you pluck all the others. So that all of the nutrients feed the healthier, stronger ones. So that they will be even healthier and stronger than they would have been had they been crowded out by the others. And so it is with a life of faith. The parts of us that are dead, the parts of us that are not producing good fruit are trimmed away. And the parts of us that need a little bit of work, even if they're producing fruit but not as good of fruit as it could be, those are trimmed and pruned and worked on by the master gardener so that the part of our lives can produce better fruit, bigger fruit, healthier fruit, a healthier faith, a healthier life in the Spirit. Jesus tells the disciples at this point and tells us, you are clean. I've trimmed you. I've worked on you. Because you have heard my words. You have heard my teaching. But if you want to maintain this cleanliness, if you want to maintain the level of health that I have given to you, then you must remain in me. Andrew Murray is a 19th century theologian <coughs> and, uh, well, spiritualist who who wrote a number of books that, that are wonderful books about, about well, our spiritual lives. Lives of discipleship, lives of, of fruit-bearing. Some of his readings are difficult to read because they're readings that are meant to prune us, to shape us, to cut away the parts of us that aren't healthy. Other books are, are designed to feed us, to encourage us to grow. One of those books that has had a profound impact on my life is based on John 15. It's called Abiding in Christ. It's a series of daily readings meant to be read over one month about a practice of the full abiding presence of Christ. Andrew Murray took a little bit of uh, he took a little bit of an issue with the modern translations of the Bible as we read through our NIV today. The modern uh, translation renders the Greek here, remain. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. He didn't particularly like that translation of the word. To remain, or to simply stay, has a bit of a stagnant quality to it. It implies simply being where you are. Abide, a little bit older word. But the nuances to the definition of the word abide, there is an intentionality to it. To abide is to live. It is to live in the place where you are. Not to simply stay, but to thrive. That I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. I will live in you, I will work in you, and you will grow. 
Jesus tells his disciples and John tells us that apart from that abiding presence of Christ, there is nothing we can do. But all too often, that is the problem, isn't it? We try to do things without Jesus. We try to do things with our own human understanding, through our own human ability. We try to impose our own human will on any given situation. And for anyone operating out of this particular flawed line of thinking, Jesus seems to be saying, good luck. Good luck with that. Good luck with trying to do anything apart from me. Good luck with trying to do anything away from me. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. That the only way to produce fruit is through Jesus. The only way to produce fruit is to abide in him and for him to abide in us. A very familiar passage from Galatians where Paul describes to his readers the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fruits of the Spirit, proof of the Spirit's work in you, proof of a healthy life of faith. Signs that one is abiding in Jesus and that Jesus is abiding in them. Signs that, that show we have taken his teachings to heart. That we seek to live out his teachings in our daily lives. But they are signs which to me are really hard to display and hard to live out without other people. Being patient with ourselves is one thing. Being patient with a five-year-old, that's a whole other thing. Gentleness and self-control with yourself and gentleness and self-control with that relative that you just can't stand to see every Thanksgiving and Christmas, that's a whole other thing. The fruits of the Spirit cannot be manifested in isolation. The life of faith cannot be lived in isolation. It cannot be fruitful and productive in isolation. Something many of us have encountered over these last several months. How do we live out a life of faith when I can't even be with other people? So one of the things many of us have engaged in over these last several months is to, is to pray more, to read our Bibles more. To do more of those individual things that we are able to do when isolated. And those are very good things to do. But the problem is, the fruits of the Spirit cannot be manifested in simply the religious practices we engage in every day. They are good, healthy things. The, the practices we take part in, coming to this place, opening our Bibles, quiet time, journaling, fasting, whatever it might be. Those are all good things. They're how the fruits and of the Spirit are cultivated in our lives. But those in and of themselves are not the final ripe product. Paul doesn't say reading your Bible more is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Praying more is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Denying yourself is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. They are the ways by which we cultivate those fruits. But those fruits must come out in the way we engage with the regular things of life. It is not faith in isolation, it is faith in community. They are important practices because they are one of the ways in which we abide. That we remain in Him through the practices that we engage in, but we cannot simply sit in those places. We abide in him and he abides in us, then what? We must produce fruit. For through our abiding, we experience God's love. And through that abiding, we are then able to share that love with the people that we encounter on a regular basis. 
the post office, the library, the grocery store, our classrooms, our workplaces, even those difficult relatives on holidays. But it's only through remaining in Him and Him remaining in us that that kind of love is possible. Jesus tells his, his disciples that how we prove we have kept his commands, how we prove that his word dwells within us, is through our love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. It is the keeping that leads to love. Just as Jesus set the example for us. Just as Jesus kept his Father's commands and remained in the Father's love. Keeping his Father's commands all the way to a cross. And that through Jesus' abiding presence, through our abiding in him, Jesus tells us we will find joy. Not a fleeting, temporary kind of joy, but a lasting joy, a true joy. The joy of perfect communion with God. The joy that comes from doing the Father's will. The joy that comes from knowing we are part of something greater, something beyond us. A joy that comes from living out our purpose in life. The reason we were created and put here in the first place. That through abiding, we find that. That through abiding, we find love. Through abiding, we share that love. At this point, Jesus has now given his disciples and given us, the readers, 2,000 years later, three gifts. My peace I give you, John wrote back in 1427. My love I give you, that we just read here in verse 10, and now he has given us his joy. Peace, love, and joy. Ours, gifts through Jesus. Gifts we receive and maintain through his abiding presence. Him in us and us in him. But only once up until this point did John use the word joy all the way back in chapter 3. At this point, Jesus goes on to use the word seven more times. It's kind of an odd thing that here, at the end of it all, hours from now, Jesus would be hanging on a cross. By the time the sun sets on the next day, he will have died. But here, Jesus gives joy, complete joy, lasting joy. But it's not simply a joy that, that comes from imitation. It's not imitating the works of Jesus and copying the life of Jesus that we find recording in the Gospels. It is a joy that comes from the life of Jesus in each of us. That discipleship is more than doing good works for the sake of doing good works. That discipleship, joy, and life come from works that Christ is doing in us and through us. It is not the branch producing the fruit but it is our connection to the vine that makes it possible. It is our abiding in Jesus so completely that our every thought and action come directly from our connection to him and him alone. The hop vines that climb the trellis and hopefully someday will fill the upper part of the contraption I built, they don't get to decide what they will someday produce. They're a hop plant, plain and simple. When mature, they will produce a cone. That cone will be used for whatever purpose I decide to use it for. 
They'll never produce grapes. They'll never produce tomatoes. They'll never be daisies or roses. They are hot plants, because that is what they are. That is what they have been created to be. That is what they grow from. The vine that feeds us, the vine that we grow from, determines the fruits that we will produce. As long as we are connected to that vine, as long as we are fed from that vine, we will receive everything we need. A vine that apart from which we would wither and die. So in the vine we must remain. In the vine we must abide. In Jesus, and Jesus alone, we abide. So that he might produce his fruits through us, his branches. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for your sustaining presence. Without you, there would be no life. Without you, there would be no growth. Without you, there would be nothing. May we always truly and wholly abide in you, drawing all we need for life from you, receiving every good gift that you have through our connection to you. As we live in you and you live in us, may that life produce fruit and may that fruit bless the world around us. In your mighty name, amen. We'll finish our time this morning with our last hymn, hymn number 679. And please stand as we sing. Jesus Christ.
we go to be his body in a broken world. And may the grace of God and the love of Christ go with you all.